Do you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. This is Southwestern's Dental Assisting Program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Hi, my name is Ron Metzger and I've been teaching geology at Southwestern Oregon Community College for the last 20 years. It's an exciting time to be teaching in the health and science fields at SWAC as we work towards funding a new health and science facility at the college. Kalito Hall is the building I work in and it houses our science labs. It was constructed in 1965 so the labs have undergone relatively little updating since that time. Over the years, we faculty have provided an exceptional foundation in the lab sciences. It's relatively easy to see how an investment in the health side of the facility will pay dividends in our local communities. The added lab and class space will allow additional cohorts in nursing students and new programs. This will allow our local residents to go through the programs and earn family wage jobs at Bay Area Hospital and all of our other local healthcare providers. As we look forward, it'll be interesting to see what we accomplish as a college and community with lab facilities and equipment equal to the task of teaching in the 21st century. I hope you will work with me as we move forward with this project.
that means that our earthquake rate is more or less constant in here, but you see it start turning upwards, and this is a rapid acceleration of the earthquake rate. And really what I'm just trying to show you is that this change in the earthquake rate is due to oil and gas production. Now on the right-hand side is actually a Photoshop that I stole from somebody online, because when we think of Oklahoma, we think of tornadoes, but now it is the capital of earthquakes, at least in the continental United States, so it's now just not only the home of, of the tornado, it's the home of the quake NATO. And so what I, the first thing that I thought of when humans are really causing earthquakes is these earthquakes are not being caused in the way you might think. It is not Mac Zorin trying to cause an earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area and a view to a kill. Nor is it Lex Luthor trying to cause earthquakes in the San Francisco Bay Area in Superman 1. I'm not sure why everybody is going after where I live, but uh, it is, it is remarkable, and in, and in fact, what they show in Superman 1 in 1979 is more or less exactly the way we are causing earthquakes right now. He wanted to pump a bunch of water into the San Andreas Fault, loosening it up, causing earthquakes, and that's pretty much what we're seeing. Fortunately, instead of the San Andreas, for me, we're seeing it in Oklahoma. Now, what I'll do with the rest of the presentation is I first want to sort of take you back into history and show you that induced earthquakes, human-caused earthquakes, are, are a phenomenon that's existed for over a century. We'll go through a few different kinds of these human-caused earthquakes, and then we'll start looking at what's happening now. Oklahoma really is the epicenter of this activity. We'll go through what the physical mechanisms are behind these earthquakes, and we'll go through a couple of different case studies, and finally we'll wrap up with a little bit of outlook. Where, where are we going? How are things looking? Et cetera. So the first known induced earthquakes occurred in the early 1890s. These are photos from gold mining operations in Johannesburg, South Africa. And what they were doing there is what's known as room and pillar mining. Basically, you excavate a very large area, that's your room, and you just leave some small pillars remaining to hold it up. Now every once in a while these will wind up collapsing and causing a small amount of shaking. And it was collapses of these gold mines that caused shaking that was strong enough to feel in the town of Johannesburg. And so these earthquakes were induced earthquakes related to mining. Now that's one term that I want to clarify here because I may use this a little bit interchangeably in the talk. When I say an earthquake is an induced earthquake, it is an earthquake that is caused by human activity, an earthquake that would not have occurred were it not for human actions. I may also use the term triggered, but I mean the same thing if I say something is triggered or induced. Now, induced seism seismicity has led to a number of developments in the seismological community. Following some seismicity in Germany related to coal mining, the Germans founded the Bochum Seismological uh, Observatory in 1908, and a dozen years later in the Silesia Coal Basin of Poland, a seismic monitoring network was developed explicitly for the purpose of monitoring induced earthquakes. So induced earthquakes go back a long way, not just for uh, mining-related earthquakes, but another a number of other causes. Now this beautiful vacation spot that you see here is Goose Creek, Texas. This is on the Gulf Coast of Texas, uh, about an hour outside of Houston. And in the 1920s, they were very, very aggressively uh, producing oil and gas in the area. That's what each one of these oil derricks is, uh, is doing there. And by this very aggressive extraction of the oil and gas, you create this, these large void spaces, and you've changed the stress conditions on faults beneath it. And so what actually happened here is they started experiencing earthquakes, earthquakes nearly as large as a magnitude 4, and these were happening in the 1920s. And to my knowledge, these are the only earthquakes to ever have been felt in the city of Houston. So the last historic set of induced earthquakes that I want to mention are, are reservoir-induced earthquakes. So earthquakes that are caused due to the filling or uh, removal of water in a water reservoir. And when Lake Mead was being filled in the 1930s, you're adding a whole lot of weight, and they started experiencing earthquakes in the area. Earthquakes as large as mid-magnitude threes uh, were believed to be caused by the filling of Lake Mead. Fortunately, the seismicity waned away, but we did see earthquakes related here. So you can see that the history of induced seismicity, this isn't something that's just happened in the last decade or so in Oklahoma. It's a worldwide problem. It's something that humans have been doing for over a century. Now, 
When I or other seismologists start thinking about earthquakes, we see an earthquake in a place that doesn't quite make sense. Let's say in Oklahoma, for example, and people, the question always now comes to me, well, do you think this is induced? And I sort of go down this checklist right here, and, and this will give me sort of a way to start thinking about it. First, are these earthquakes close in space to something that could cause it? Are we doing some human activity that could cause it that's nearby? If yes, well, maybe it's induced. The next criterion that I look at is, are these close in time to some human activity? Did we start filling a reservoir? Did we start injecting into a well shortly before these earthquakes started? And the third criterion I think about is, are these earthquakes close to the surface? Human activities are going to be at the surface or very, very close to the surface, so our effects are going to be felt most strongly at the surface. And so if earthquakes fit all of these criteria, this is a good suggestion that the earthquakes may be induced, but these are unfortunately not hard and fast rules. I can provide dozen examples, dozens of examples that violate individual ones of these rules, and I can off the top of my head think of one earthquake sequence that violates every single one of these rules. So these are good things to think about, but they aren't something that you can just say yes or no, we are looking at an induced earthquake. Now why are induced earthquakes suddenly such a big issue in the United States? Well, I think this graph really sums it up. What we're looking at is an annual count of magnitude 3 earthquakes uh, per year in the central United States. And you can see here in the 1970s and 80s or even on into the mid-2000s, the earthquake rate is very low. You're looking at about 20 to 30 magnitude 3 earthquakes across the central United States. And then the earthquake ramp rate ramps up in about 2009 skyrocketing to over a thousand magnitude threes in 2015 and it's begun declining. We're down to less than uh, 400 last year. But this dramatic increase uh, really represents uh, why people have suddenly gotten so interested is, is it's not just that there's small earthquakes, there are actually now damaging earthquakes. So these are just two photos uh, from some of the larger earthquakes that we've seen in this surge of seismicity in the past nine years. On the left-hand side is a photo from the magnitude 5.3 Trinidad, Colorado earthquake. This earthquake happened in August of 2011 and caused a significant amount of damage, but fortunately it was in a relatively unpopulated area, so there wasn't that much damage associated with it. And in the lower right is, is a photo of, of damage from a magnitude 5.7 earthquake in Oklahoma, again in 2011. So it's not just magnitude 3s we're seeing magnitude 5 earthquakes, and these are earthquakes that are going to be causing damage. So what does, what does the distribution of seismicity really look like? So on the left-hand side, what we're looking at is uh, earthquakes over a 35-year period from 1973 to 2008, and on the right-hand side, we're looking at seismicity from 2009 to just a couple of days ago. And while it may not look like it, there are about four times as many earthquakes in this right-hand side figure than there are in this period, despite the fact that this is only nine years and this is 36. So something very remarkably different is happening in these two periods. If we look at this 36-year period from 73 to 2008, we count 852 magnitude 3 earthquakes, so an average of 24 earthquakes a year. But looking at this, you can see it's more or less a scatter shot of seismicity. There's seismicity kind of everywhere. Yes. There are clusters of seismicity in here. This is known as the New Madrid seismic zone. There's a cluster of seismicity here. This is the Eastern Tennessee shear zone. But other than that, there's just really sort of a scattering of seismicity. And that's more or less what we would expect in the central United States because you don't have very well developed fault zones in the area. But if we look at just the past 10 years, things look very, very different. Again, remember we have nearly four times as many earthquakes in this picture as we did in the last one, yet most of the map is bare. Uh, it's, it's really due to this large concentration of seismicity in a few different locations. The most important one obviously being central Oklahoma and southern Kansas. You also see some here in the Raton Basin. That's where that Trinidad earthquake was. And then there's a few spots here in Texas. And we can really highlight this by taking account of the earthquakes and sort of subtracting out the areas where we think these earthquakes are induced. So now on the left-hand side, what we're looking at again is a cumulative count of earthquakes with time. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract out the seismicity from this cumulative rate from areas where we know there's induced seismicity. And once this line becomes horizontal, we'll know that more, more or less back to our background rate or we're only looking at natural seismicity. So let's first subtract out Oklahoma. And, and well, the line's almost gotten to be flat already just by subtracting out Oklahoma. But let's, let's continue the exercise and we'll subtract out the Raton Basin. It's flattened out further. And we're then gonna subtract out the Guy Greenbrier sequence. And then we can subtract out Texas and now we're basically flat. We're back to where we were. And so we've just subtracted out a very small number of areas that have known induced seismicity and now our seismicity rate is more or less back to what it was. And so this really shows us that our natural seismicity is not changing. It's just the induced seismicity that is causing this change in the earthquake rate. And clearly Oklahoma is the big source of this seismicity rate change. But a way I like to highlight how big this change is, is to start comparing the seismicity in Oklahoma to California. And if you look here, shown in blue is a count of magnitude three and larger. And I should, should say I'm counting magnitude three and larger earthquakes because that's where our catalog is complete. We're certain that we have all earthquakes of this size and larger. And for earthquakes smaller, we might be missing some. So shown in blue is a count of magnitude three and larger earthquakes in California by year, and in red is a count of magnitude three and larger earthquakes for Oklahoma. And you can see with the exception of a few spikes here in, in California, you're averaging somewhere between 350 and 500 earthquakes per year. You have these big spikes at the time of large earthquakes, and so you'd expect your earthquake rate to go up because you're going to have lots of aftershocks. And so the last large earthquake that we had in California was the Sierra El Mayor earthquake, in 2009, and so that's where this spike of aftershocks is occurring. But, and you can see up until 2014, California is far ahead of Oklahoma. They're not even in our rearview mirror. But if you get to 2014, Oklahoma has surpassed California and has more than doubled California in 2015. The seismicity rate is dropping down. And uh, in, in 2017, it was just a little bit higher than it was in California. But when we think of earthquakes in the continental United States, we always think of California, but clearly Oklahoma is taking that title away from California for the moment. Now, while the earthquake rate in Oklahoma, you can see here, is declining, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Oklahoma saw three magnitude five earthquakes to occur in 2016, even while the earthquake rate was declining. So the first earthquake happened in January of 2016. It was a magnitude 5.1 earthquake, the Fairview earthquake. Fortunately, this earthquake occurred more or less in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't a lot of damage. This is, I think, the only photo of damage from this earthquake that I was able to find. The next earthquake that occurred was in September, and this is the magnitude 5.8 Pawnee earthquake. This is the largest earthquake to have occurred historically in Oklahoma. Again, this earthquake occurred in a relatively unpopulated area, so there wasn't very much damage, despite the fact it being much larger than this 5.1 earthquake. And the most damaging earthquake to actually occur was the October magnitude five Cushing earthquake. And the reason this earthquake was so much more damaging than any of the others is that it was in the middle of the town of Cushing. Now Cushing is a town of only 8,000 people, but the fact that this was in town as opposed to these other earthquakes that have occurred uh, made it much more damaging. Now keep in mind, we've only had four magnitude fives in Oklahoma and three of them happened in 2016. Now Cushing is an area that we should be particularly interested in. It is the home of some very, very important infrastructure in the United States. Cushing calls itself the pipeline crossroads of the world there are nine major oil and pi gas pipelines going through there. And as of 10 years ago, it held about 10% of the US crude storage capacity. And right now they are full up. There is no room there. So they're, they're storing a whole lot of oil there, about 60 million barrels of, of oil stored. And if you look at any one of these individual barrel looking things, those are about a football field long. They are gigantic. I've gone out and visited them. It is an incredibly impressive operation. And looking at this Google Earth image down to the lower right, you can see the scale 
uh, of how much oil is being stored in the area. And if you're having large earthquakes there, there's a lot of risk that is there. Fortunately, uh, the operators in the area take this very seriously and are, are conducting seismic monitoring and have plans to deal with this, but, but obviously there, there's a lot of risk in the area. And we have seen a number of magnitude fours in the years leading up to 2016 and then the magnitude five in 2016. So I next I'm going to show you, hopefully with sound, of animation of earthquakes in Oklahoma. And what you're going to see is, is you'll hear a pop coming with an earthquake. And so things are going to start out very slowly because we're still very early in this earthquake sequence. But the sounds will get deeper as the earthquakes are larger and the earthquakes are sized according to their magnitude. So things are starting to speed up. This is the Oklahoma City area. And I'll just let it run. It's not exciting yet. So, so there's, a, there's a kid out there that was covering his ears, and just imagine if you were living in Oklahoma and feeling these earthquakes. It's, it's, uh, it's an incredible sequence. Now, unfortunately, this video ends at the end of 2016, so we don't really experience the decline in the seismicity rate, but I think this really highlights for you how dramatic this change in the earthquake rate really is. But let's step back, and you may, you may be saying, Justin, how is it you have all these earthquakes in Oklahoma? Oklahoma's in the middle of the country. It's in the middle of the continent. There's no tectonics there. How could there be faults? How can you have these earthquakes? Well, uh, unfortunately, there are faults everywhere. Uh, this is a map that was put together by the Oklahoma Geological Survey uh, in collaboration with a whole lot of industry partners. And I, uh, that's actually something, just as an aside, that I found really pleasing in I've wound up having to work with a lot of industry, um, and I feel like industry has really turned a corner and is very interested in working with academics and government scientists because this is a problem for all of us. It's bad for business, so they're invested in figuring this out. And so the OGS with industry put together this incredible fault map of, of Oklahoma, and so you can see there are faults just about everywhere in Oklahoma, and the same could be said for just about anywhere in the world. There are faults everywhere, so if you're able to load them you can have earthquakes. So now let's start walking through some different oil and gas operations that have been connected to induced earthquakes in the past. We'll first talk about hydraulic fracturing, which is probably what most of you in the room think is responsible for the earthquakes. I'm sorry to tell you that's not the case. Uh, but hydraulic fracturing has been linked to earthquakes as large as magnitude 4.9. In the United States, it's more like a 3.3 or 3.5. And I still think the 4.9 really is under debate. Uh, oil production, which is just oil and gas extraction, has been linked to earthquakes about a, ma about a magnitude 7. There was a series of three earthquakes in the late 1970s and early 1980s in Uzbekistan that are believed to be related to uh, gas production. But ob obviously we don't, we don't know a whole lot because uh, this, this was during the, the, area where the era where there wasn't much communication uh, across the Iron Curtain. So wastewater disposal, which is going to be the real bugaboo that we're experiencing here in the United States, has caused earthquakes as large as a magnitude 5.8. That includes the Pawnee earthquake. And you can see it doesn't look to be a particularly impressive operation, right? This is a photo of a wastewater disposal well that I visited a number of years ago in Weld County outside of Denver. Again, not a particularly impressive operation. Hard to believe that that causes earthquakes that big. And on, on the right here is just a, is another process called enhanced oil recovery, and it's been linked to earthquakes about a magnitude four and a half. So all the operations that I've shown you either involve injection or extraction of fluid. So I want to go through briefly what are, what are the physics behind this? How do these operations cause earthquakes? So let's first focus on the right-hand side. And this will work for all four of these. You're either pulling something out of the ground or you're putting something into the ground. So you're changing the amount of mass in the earth. And so by pressing down or pulling up, if you happen to be above or near a fault, 
you're going to change the conditions on that fault. And so that may encourage slip on it or it may discourage it. So that's one model. But in general, we don't think this is the model for what's actually happening here. What we think is actually happening is this model on the left, where we have a, a well where we've drilled in and we're I injecting into some fluid reservoir. And where that reservoir, once in a while, will connect up to a fault. And so by adding water into this reservoir, you're more or less adding water into this fault. And you're raising the fluid pressure. And so you're slightly prying this fault apart. And so you might think of it as more or less lubricating this fault, making it more likely to have an earthquake. So let's take a look at an animation that we put together. Now we've got, here's a well right here, and you're going to be injecting water into it. And you can see very clearly the fault. And so the fault right now, you can see these arrows, is being pressed closed by the na natural tectonic stress. Your water is going down. It's going to start spreading out into the formation that you're injecting into. And you can see it. It'll eventually hit this fault, and you'll start seeing this fluid start to travel up this fault. And now you can see, see how these arrows used to be going inward, pressing this fault closed? Now you're, what you're seeing is that the fault is being pried open. And so as you pry that fault open more and more, you're making it more likely to have an earthquake. And eventually you'll see a cartoon animation of there being slip on this fault any minute now. There we go. So this is how we imagine these are being caused. It's basically water penetrating into these faults, slightly prying them open, or lubricating them, making them more likely to have earthquakes. So I want to focus on hydraulic fracturing and wastewater disposal because these are the two big things that people think about. Here's just a couple of photos. One uh, in the upper part is a picture of a frack job. These are incredibly complicated operations. I've been out to a couple, and it is impressive uh, the amount of technology that is going on here. In the bottom is, is a picture that I took from a, a frack site, again, in Weld County. And these take a whole lot of water. These are, there's a line of about 100 tanker trucks of water at this one individual site. But hydraulic fracturing is actually a very old process. It was invented over 70 years ago in the Huguenin field in Kansas. And in some sense, you are intentionally making earthquakes. And generally, you're intentionally making very, very small earthquakes, magnitude minus 2 to magnitude 1, earthquakes that we're never going to feel at the surface, the goal of which is to create a situation like this. In the upper part, you're in a situation where you can only access the, the oil that's in these shaded in areas, but by pressing in water at very high pressure, you're able to access much more oil. And that's the idea behind it. And so it's a high pressure injection intended to increase permeability. These operations are going to be very short duration, typically hours or maybe a couple of days in the absolute largest. And the amount of water is typically going to be about 60 to 100,000 barrels per well. For the beer drinkers in the room, a barrel is two kegs worth. If you're not a beer drinker, there are 42 gallons in a barrel. Um, but so once you've completed your hydraulic fracturing, you go into production. And so you start extracting your oil and gas. There's no such thing as a hydraulic fracturing well. You hydraulically fracture a well, and then you put it into production. And so what we're looking at here is just a cartoon of a hydraulically fractured well. You can see that this well has been drilled downwards. This is going to be your production formation. And you can see all of these little fractures here. You've expanded sort of the reach that this well is more or less able to see, the amount of area that it's able to extract oil from. So let's take a look at another animation of hydraulic fracturing. So here we've got our well. We've drilled all the way down. This is we're, We turned our well to stay into our pay formation. We finish the well, and then the next thing that you need to do is you need to cement and case the well. So you wind up pouring down a whole bunch of cement to seal off the well from the outside area. You don't want to leak you well. And then following that, you're going to put in a cement pipe, and that's really going to be the real structural integrity of your well. Well, now nothing is going to be flowing in and out of your well because you have cement and steel. So what you next need to do is you more or less lower down a gun. And what they do is they'll lower down this gun, uh, here we go, and you're going to what's known as perp the well. You set off charges so that you can open the, the, a spot in the casing as well as the, um, as the cement. And then you're going to push in this water at very high pressure 
So the water is going to go out these perforations and press on these rocks until they break open. So that should happen any minute. Here we go. And so the water's going to go in, and you can see there's going to be these new fractures opening up. And so that means that we're instead of able to access much more oil. And so in a horizontal well, drillers will, uh, will often repeat this process. So we've just, we've just fracked the toe of this well. And so what you'll see is that they'll go in and frack another stage of this well. And that's what this is called, is multi-stage fracking. So they're going to lower the gun down again, perf the well, and then they're going to hydraulically fracture it again. And so in some of these, in some wells, you have five miles of wells. So you're going to wind up perforating and fracturing a number of different times. And that's how hydraulic fracturing can take days. So that's what hydraulic fracturing is. But let's talk about wastewater disposal. But before we talk about wastewater disposal, I think there's a very important question that needs to be answered, and that is, what is wastewater? Most of the wastewater that is disposed of is what's known as co-produced water. This is water that is trapped in the same formation as oil and gas. Oil and gas are the decomposed biological components of relict oceans. And so there's going to be salt water because the salt water was with it when it was just biological components. So if we look at this simple cartoon here, here we've got our oil well that's drilled into this oil bearing formation. And in the same formation, we have this salt water. And so when you pull out the oil, you just, by, by virtue of sucking out oil, you're going to get some salt water with it. Depending on the area that you're in, there can be a whole lot of salt water. And in some areas, there's very, very little. But in the area of Oklahoma, where most of these earthquakes are occurring, this is a very low cut area. And so by low cut, I'm, what I mean is that there's far more water than there is oil. In some parts of Oklahoma, you're looking at 20 parts water to one part oil. Now, frac fluids are also a part of wastewater. In Oklahoma, it probably makes up about 10%. Uh, but in other places like Ohio, it is nearly all frac fluids. But in the areas where we're seeing the most problems, it, uh, it really only makes up a small percentage of wastewater. So you've got all this wastewater. What are your options? Well, if it's frac fluid, you can try to reuse it, reuse it because frac fluid is fresh water, and fresh water is expensive. And so the oil companies will do that if that is viable. The second option is discharge on the surface. There's obviously going to be environmental regulations. If the water is clean enough or can be cleaned to discharge it on the surface, use it for agricultural purposes, of course they're going to do that. Having spoken to a number of colleagues in industry, the sort of water that you're pulling out in Oklahoma, you're going to be spending about $100 per barrel to make that water clean enough. Keep in mind you're going to have 20 barrels of that for every one barrel of oil. Right now, oil is going somewhere from between $40 and $50 a barrel. The, the economics don't work out for that. And so the last option is disposal at depths, and that's drilling a deeper well and putting the water away in there. And so that's what's, what industry is doing and what they've been doing for decades. And so wastewater disposal is you're drilling a deep well into a porous formation and injecting water into that formation with the hopes that you never hear from it again. And, well, it's... It's worked almost perfectly until the last few years. These are wells that can operate for years or even decades. And some of these wells can be incredibly large, up to a million barrels or more a month. There are about 35,000 of these that are operated in the United States. And really, only a few of these have actually been connected to felt earthquakes. So I told you that wastewater disposal was more important than hydraulic fracturing. Let's just do a thought experiment and figure out well, is, is what I'm telling you, does that make sense? Hydraulic fracturing is a short-term process, typically over hours or days, and it's a very low-volume process, let's say 100,000 barrels or so. Wastewater disposal is a very long-term process. You're operating wells for years or decades, and it's a high volume. You're looking at you know, upwards of a million barrels a month. So with wastewater disposal, you're exposing a much larger area because you're injecting more water, and you're going to be exposing it for a much longer period of time than you are hydraulic fracturing. So it stands to reason that you're more probable to induce earthquakes with wastewater disposal than it is with hydraulic fracturing. Well, and that's exactly what is borne out with the statistics. Wastewater disposal has many 
felt earthquakes associated with it, including more than 20 damaging earthquakes, whereas hydraulic fracturing has been connected to very few felt earthquakes, and to my knowledge, no damaging earthquakes. And this is in spite of very different statistics. There have been over a million frac stages completed in the United States, and we only have about 35,000 operational wastewater disposal wells. So despite this difference, disparity in numbers, the amount of area that you're exposing and the amount of time that you're exposing things makes wastewater disposal much more likely to cause earthquakes. Now I've told you that both of these are old processes. So, so what is it that's changed? Why are we having all these earthquakes if we're using these old techniques? What's really changed is an evolution, a different evolution in drilling technology. Until a dozen or 15 years ago, nearly all wells were drilled vertically. Steering wells is very, very difficult. And when you drill a vertical well, you're only going to drill into areas where your oil to water ratio is favorable. You're only going to do it when you can make money. So let's say you're going to produce a, a kiddie's pool's worth of water. But in the last dozen or 15 years, uh, oil companies have developed technology to, to steer their wells very well. And they're able to more or less turn them horizontally and stay in a very narrow formation. And so what that means is it's now economical to go after formations that have much more water. And so now instead of a kiddie pool's worth of water, you're producing an Olympic-sized swimming pool. There's about 10 times more water comes out of an average horizontally drilled well uh, per barrel of oil than it is for a vertical well. And so this is the real source of all the extra water that we're seeing. This is the real change is that we've gone to drilling horizontal wells. So now I want to give you a, a brief history lesson, tell you a bit, I told you a little bit about the history of induced seismicity going back you know, 120 years. Let's talk about the history of injection induced seismicity. And the observations go back to the 1960s, so we're 50 years ago. Uh, and what we're looking at here is a photo of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. If you've ever flown into Denver and tried to go skiing in the Rockies, taken the 70, you've driven past Rocky Mountain Arsenal. In the 1960s, they were producing chemical weapons at Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And as you might expect, if you produce chemical weapons, you've got a lot of nasty waste. And so the Army said to themselves, what can we do? We've got to get rid of this. They drilled a very deep well and started flushing it away. And well, uh, just a few months later, people started feeling earthquakes in the city of Denver. And it actually, it's a, it's a really interesting detective story. We had never observed earthquakes like this before, so it took scientists a number of months to actually figure out what was occurring that these earthquakes were being caused by the injection, because obviously the Army was a bit cagey about what was actually going on. But just this graph shows you the, the very nice connection between the injection and the earthquake. So on the bottom is the millions of gallons fluid injected per month, and on the top is a count of earthquakes. And so you can see the injection turns on, and the earthquakes start a month or two later. They turned off the injection actually for a year because they wanted to see what was going on, and the seismicity turned off. Then they turned it back on, and well, the, the earthquakes turned back on again. Uh, and so they finally shut down the well in mid-1965. And so this earthquake sequence, the largest earthquake that was caused, was about a magnitude 4.9. And you can see that it did cause a little bit, da little bit of damage. That's a damage to a, a bridge overpass. Uh, but there's a few important lessons to take away from this, earth this earthquake sequence. First. The largest earthquake in this earthquake sequence happened in 1966. The, they stopped injecting in 1965. So the largest earthquake happened over a year after they stopped injection. So turning off injection isn't an instant fix. Second, they in fact saw earthquakes at this site for 15 years after injection stopped. So maybe this is a unique location, but seismicity can persist for a long time after industrial activities have stopped. And the last thing to take away is to, to look at this figure here in the lower right. We're looking at a cross section, so we've cut away the earth and we're looking at the side inward of the earth. So down is down in this plot is down into the earth. This is the location of the well. And all of these dots are earthquakes. And the circle I've just drawn a three mile radius around the bottom of the well. And you can see all of these earthquakes are three miles or more away from this well. And so we're causing earthquakes at least three miles away from this. So this is, this was really the, this is the, the starter case. This is where we learned that injection can cause earthquakes. 
So I next want to talk about what was, is really the landmark study of induced seismicity. And this is the Rangeley experiment. And I, I would like to call them colleagues, but they were long before me. Uh, so, so some of my predecessors at the USGS, actually at the same office as I am in, in Menlo Park, convinced Chevron to give them control of part of one of their fields in western Colorado, in Rangeley, Colorado. Chevron had been experiencing problems with induced seismicity. And these guys, uh, so this is Barry Raleigh, John Breedhoff, and, and Jack Healy, who's not pictured, they said they had a hypothesis for what was going on. They thought fluid pressure is what's driving these earthquakes, just like I've explained to you. And so they convinced Chevron, they said, all right, we want to conduct an experiment. We think we can turn these earthquakes on, and then we can turn them off. And so to test their hypothesis of fluid pressure, what they said is, we'll inject as hard as we can for six months. We'll raise the fluid pressure as much as we can. And we should see a bunch of earthquakes. And then we're going to return the reservoir. We're going to suck everything out. We're going to return the reservoir back to its original state. And in its original state, it, there weren't any earthquakes. And so if we don't see any earthquakes, this will show us that the fluid pressure is what's driving things. And well, so they did that experiment. And the results were pretty much exactly what they predicted. So again, we're looking in cross section here. Um, so we're looking at a six month period here where they were injecting as hard as they could. And you can see here are the bottoms of four wells. And you can see there's a bunch of earthquakes right next to these wells. And then there's some seismicity a little bit uh, more distant. And then, so six months, lots of earthquakes injecting hard. Return the reservoir back to its natural state. And now we're looking at a year as opposed to six months. There's almost no earthquakes. And so this is, this is really the best evidence that we have that the fluid pressure is what's controlling the seismicity. Obviously, there is a little bit of seismicity at these far areas, but that probably has to do with the fact you weren't fully able to return these reservoirs back to their natural state. So let's now move forward out, out of history, and I want to talk about a couple of different studies of induced seismicity that, that are recent. And I really want to bring you to what is, in, in my opinion, one of the best studies of, of recent induced seismicity. Uh, because it, how comprehensive it was. This is some work looking at earthquakes near Azle, Texas. Azle is an exurb of, of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You might be able to see here's Fort Worth and here's Dallas, and so Azle is right in this area. And so what we're looking at is just a shake map. So this is how people perceived the shaking from the earthquake. And this is an earthquake sequence that had some magnitude threes in late 2013 and early 2014. People here, people in California probably would not care about an earthquake this size, but it's rather alarming to people in Texas. And so through the mayor, they made appeals to Congress, to their congressperson, and it wound up on our desks at the USGS. And so we worked with uh, Southern Methodist University in, in Dallas to study these earthquakes. Now, as you might expect, uh, the USGS does not have seismometers everywhere. We're going to have more seismometers in areas where we have earthquakes. And so we did not have many seismometers in this area. And what we're going to see is a demonstration of how that affects our understanding of earthquakes. So this is what the earthquake sequence looks like if we just process it with seismometers that we had in sort of before the earthquake sequence looked like. Look, keep in mind this is 15 miles across. Now we actually, in response, put out some seismometers to record these earthquakes. And so relocating these with those same seismometers, we're now looking at a spot that's about a mile across. And so this really shows us how important it is that we have this high density of instrumentation. And we really, most of the time, we're in situations where we're having earthquakes where we don't expect them. This is the situation we're looking at. And so we're never going to be able to understand what's happening scientifically if we have such a poor distribution of seismometers. So what this team from SMU uh, did is they really tried to understand what are all the possible causes for this earthquake and wanted to go through them all and say yes or no did these cause this earthquake and so the obvious first question is could these earthquakes be natural that's always a very important question to ask and while there really was no history of seismicity in the area and given the elevated rate not just that there were one or two threes but there were a bunch of threes it seemed highly improbable that the earthquake sequence was natural the next question was uh, is, were these earthquakes, so that's these, these blue dots here, were these due to the, the lake level changes in Eagle Mountain Lake? That's this lake right here. Or was it perhaps due to water table decline? There was a very extended drought in Texas at the time. 
and, and so more or less natural changes, or then they started to consider was it oil and gas production or was it due to wastewater disposal? So they first considered lake level changes, and if you look at this, uh, this is the lake level as a function of time and the seismicity that we're seeing occurred right in this area. And you can see the lake levels were at their lowest at the times of the earthquake. And they said, okay, this is, this is interesting. Let's think about this a little bit more. And so what they did is they computed the stresses, the actual change in, in stress on where these faults, where these earthquakes were occurring uh, due to changes in the lake level. And you can see the outline of the lake here in, in black and the areas where the stress is being changed is just showing you uh, the colors, but all the earthquakes are over here. And so there's effectively no significant change in stress at the location of these earthquakes due to lake level changes. So they were able to rule out that the lake level changes were causing these earthquakes. They're also able to rule out changes in the water table because the changes in the water table were much smaller than the changes in the lake level. And so the so natural cause of these earthquakes really can be eliminated. So the next question is, is it oil production? Uh, this may be a little bit difficult to see in the back, but if you can kind of see that uh, the whole area looks to have chicken pox, each one of those chicken pox is a oil well. So there are oil wells everywhere. And you might be able to see this a little better if you look at this map here on the left. Each symbol and extending line, that is also a well. There are oil and gas wells everywhere here. So there's a big possibility that oil and gas production is related to it. Or there's a possibility that wastewater disposal is related to it. And there's two large wastewater disposal wells in the area that are just uh, a handful of miles away from these earthquakes. So what Matt Hornbach and his colleagues at SMU and the U USGS did is they computed numerical models to try to understand what the stresses are and how they relate to the earthquakes. So you can see in these, they've sort of stepped through in time and you see the areas where there's blue dots, those are areas where there are production wells, so extraction wells, and the red dots are the locations of where the two injection wells are. And uh, our earthquakes are sort of right in this vicinity here. And what you can see is as you move through time, and this is sort of the time of the earthquakes, the argument that they make is that, so these earthquakes are all right in here. The earthquakes lie more or less right on top of these two production wells, but the biggest source of stress changes is these injection wells. And so the conclusion is, is that it is likely due to the combined influence of both these injection wells and the production wells in the area. So like I said, this, this is really one of the most thorough uh, approaches I ha I've seen uh, to, to study and do seismicity. So I next want to show you a study that I was involved in that I, I think is really remarkable, not for, for my role, but really for, for the role that a graduate student did, in that he gathered all the data from all about 120,000 saltwater disposal and enhanced oil recovery wells in the entire continental st United States. Uh, and he, he did a very different analysis than what m most people have done when they're looking at induced seismicity. Typically when we think about induced seismicity, we say, all right, let's go look at this one area with induced seismicity. People looked at Rangeley. We just looked at Azel. We just looked at Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And so, so what Matt Weingarten did is, all right, instead of looking at an individual place, let's look at all seismicity. Let's look at all injection and see if there's something that we can learn either about injection or about earthquakes. And so we're just looking here at a, at a map of saltwater disposal wells and saltwater disposal well density. And we also consider enhanced oil recovery wells. These are a different kind of injection wells. But here you're trying to balance the injection with extraction so you wouldn't expect to see as many earthquakes. And so the question we're really trying to answer is, are there operational parameters that affect uh, how likely it is that a well would induce earthquakes? So I took our entire catalog of seismicity and we said, are these earthquakes near to an active injection well? And we just chose 15 kilometers, so about 10 miles, just as a plausible number. And said, if it is, let's, all right, let's color them in red. And so all of these red earthquakes are within 15 kilometers of an active injection well at the time of these earthquakes. But what we really want to, to know is not whether these earthquakes are induced, but could whether wells could be inducing earthquakes. So let's invert this figure. So now what we have plotted are wells. And in blue are wells that are not active, that don't have any earthquakes that could be associated with them. In yellow 
are wells that could have earthquakes associated with them. Now, I'm using a, a bit of terminology here, and I, I just want to be clear. Just because a well is associated with an earthquake does not mean it caused that earthquake. It just means theoretically it could have. And so that, they, it, it's, it makes this analysis a little bit more difficult, but it allows us to do a much broader scale analysis. And so we consider these wells, and so the first sort of obvious question is, we've seen this massive increase in seismicity. Maybe it's just because we've had a massive increase in the number of wastewater disposal wells. And well, that's, that's not borne out. Uh, we look at this figure right here. This is showing you the number of wells that were completed or the number of wells that were drilled in any individual year. Yes, our surge of seismicity is in this period right here where there's a lot of uh, wells that are being completed, but it's not totally out of tune with what we saw in the 1980s. And so this really shows to us that it's not just that we've had this massive increase in injection wells that's causing these earthquakes. So we decided to start exploring what parameters control whether, whether or not a well is likely to be associated with earthquakes or whether it's likely to have earthquakes within 15 kilometers during its operational period. So we took all 27,000 saltwater disposal wells and we considered the two parameters that, that at least all seismologists say, oh, these have got to be important. And those two parameters are what is your injection rate? What is your, how hard are you injecting? And the other parameter is what is your total injected volume? Have you been injecting for a long time? Have you injected a lot of fluid? And how does that affect your probability of having an earthquake? So let's just look at this, this first figure on the left-hand side, and we've just binned the wells up. So for all wells with, what is this, uh, 10,000 barrels injected per month, we said what percent of those wells could be associated with earthquakes. And so we did this for all of these bins going across here. And so these red dotted lines are just in uncertainty. If you're within these red lines, it's not statistically significant. And so you can see from very, very low injection rates to about 100,000 barrels a month, you don't, you're really just seeing variability within this uncertainty. But then when you get to about 100 or 200,000 barrels a month, you really start increasing in your probability. And when you get to 10 to the 6 to a million barrels a month, your probability of being associated with earthquakes is about 90%. And we see this massive increase. And so what this is telling us is the faster you're injecting, the harder you're injecting, the more likely it is that you are going to be inducing earthquakes. On the right-hand side, where we're looking at total volume, we really don't see any significant signal in that you're really rattling between your uncertainty the whole time. And that, I will admit, was a surprise to all of us. We really thought total volume was going to be important as well. But it really is not borne out in, in what we're looking at here. We also explored another, a number of other parameters, how close this well was to basement. So this is the competent hard rock that where the, your earthquakes are actually occurring. And it stands to reason that if you're close to that, the more likely it is that your fluid pressure is going to get to that area and cause these earthquakes. But we didn't see any real connection between this, nor did we see any connection between the injection pressure and how hard it is that you're pressing this water in and the probability of, of having an earthquake. Now, I should be careful and say that doesn't mean that these aren't important parameters. I think they both probably are. We just cannot see it in this particular data set. And the other set of factors, that there are a number of other factors that we really couldn't get to, like geologic factors. Uh, are there fluid pathways to get this water from the injection well to where the earthquakes are occurring? Are there faults that are oriented appropriately given the stress field. These are things that cannot be accounted for in this kind of analysis. So before I want wrap up, I want to step back and I want to talk about Oregon because bring things home to you. Uh, Oregon, lucky for you, does not have a long history of induced seismicity. To my knowledge, there is only one sequence of induced seismicity and that's at the New Newberry Geothermal site. Uh, it's about uh, 10 or 20 miles south of Bend. You can see the, the area of the project, and here's Bend up here. And so the Newberry Geothermal Site is, is what's known as an enhanced geothermal site. And what they're doing there is basically, there's, a, there's hot rocks there, and they're circulating water to try to get the heat out. They'll put in cold water, they get hot water out, turn turbines, et cetera. And so this was a pilot project that was done in 2014. It produced some earthquakes. The largest was a magnitude two and a half, or no, 2.3, excuse me. And well, that, that was about it. Uh, 
As far as as far as I know, the company has, has stopped pursuing further operations in the area. So this is this is the entire history, as far as I know, of induced seismicity here in Oregon. So lucky you. Uh, well, you do have something else to think about. Uh, <laughs> So obviously, people here are, are really concerned about the megathrust earthquakes. You can have earthquakes up to about magnitude 9, the last one being in 1700. Um, you can also have crustal earthquakes, and I think that is a hazard that is probably forgotten by most people around here. Uh, what we're looking at here in the lower left is a fault map of Oregon that is undoubtedly woefully incomplete. But you can see there's faults just about everywhere, and many of these faults are probably capable of producing a magnitude 6 or magnitude 7. So these are a real source of hazard as well. And certainly the Seattle area has experienced seismicity from these crustal faults. So uh, don't, don't, don't feel like you're being left out. And you also have to consider tsunamis are very important, especially for those of you living right here on the coast. So as a seismologist, I would be remiss if I did not encourage you to prepare. Uh, on the right-hand side is, is a picture of a brochure that the Oregon Office of Emergency Management puts out. I've, I've flipped through it. It's a, it's a really good brochure on how to prepare for earthquakes, prepare for the inevitable. And just to remind you, hopefully everybody in here knows that you need to drop, cover, and hold on in the case of an earthquake. And in the case of tsunami or strong shaking, you need to seek high ground because if you're feeling that strong shaking, it could be a crustal earthquake or it could be a megathrust earthquake. And you need to wait until you get the all clear before you come down to lower ground. You're going to be want to be making an earthquake kit, so gathering food, gathering water. You also need to make plans with your family and friends, and also getting to know your neighbors. This is probably the most important thing as far as your survival of an earth, from an earthquake is knowing your neighbors because they're much more likely to help you out if they know you're there. Uh, some good links for getting additional information on preparedness, the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, the Oregon Shakeout, this is a, actually an international thing at this point that's done across the United States and around the world. October 18th, the anniversary of the Bay Area earthquake, the World Series earthquake in 1989. Uh, you stop, you drop cover and hold on uh, just like you would an earthquake. And if you walk around my office, there's a bunch of seismologists hiding under their desks too. So you should, you should, we should know what to do. You should definitely practice as well. Um, so let's, let's get back to, uh, away from the aside, let's uh, take a look at our outlook. Let's start thinking uh, you know, where we are. So Oklahoma, again, is obviously the, the center of our attention because it's, it's the center of the seismicity. The earthquake rate has declined about 70% in the last two years. So great news. Uh, and 2018, we're only a few weeks in, but it still looks like it's declining. Further, um, and there's no question that production and injection declines are the cause of this. Um, there's undoubtedly a strong influence of economics here. The price of oil cratered in 2014, so production dropped. Uh, regulations also came into place in 2015, so that undoubtedly affected operations as well. But while this earthquake rate has dropped dramatically, uh, you still had three or four largest earthquakes to occur during this period of decline. This includes the largest historic earthquake as well as the most damaging earthquake in Oklahoma history. So while we're still declining, we're really, we're really not out of the woods. And the earthquake rate still is incredibly elevated to the average background rate of two earthquakes. We're somewhere at around two or 300 earthquakes a year. So we're still a factor of 100 higher than we would anticipate. So on a broader scale, what is our outlook? We can, in fact, control induced earthquakes to some degree and in some cases. And this photo of these two gentlemen from the Rangeley experiment shows that that works. Um, enforcement, well, it, it works some of the time. There's, there's a few success stories, Greeley, Youngstown, and Love County. Operations were shut down, seismicity stopped very shortly afterwards. But there's a number of examples that, uh, that show that uh, regulatory actions are, don't necessarily work so well. At Paradox Valley, they try, they have earthquakes that are 15 miles away, and they just can't affect them with local operations 15 miles away. And the Rocky Mountain Arsenal seismicity continued for 15 years. So we're, we can do some, th sometimes things work well, sometimes things don't. But, but a number of states are taking this seriously. All seven states that, that I would say have a, a significant problem or 
uh, at least a significant risk of a problem, have all enacted rules and regulations, and so I think that's, that's promising, although um, you can talk to me after about what I think about what's happening in California. We're only considering hydraulic fracturing, not wastewater disposal. Uh, the EPA is also taking this uh, problem very seriously. The EPA sets based guidelines for uh, class two wells, so saltwater disposal wells, and they've released guidance on how to minimize induced seismicity. Uh, my colleagues and I at the USGS have also developed models and methods to estimate induced earthquake hazard, and we're just about to release our third one-year hazard model for 2018. That should be coming out in uh, a couple of months. And so we're actually estimate the probability of shaking and or damage from these induced earthquakes. And just, just a teaser for that, uh, if you're looking here on the left-hand side, we've computed hazard for the central U.S., including induced earthquakes, and on the right you can see removing induced earthquakes, and you can see that the hazard is dramatically elevated when you start thinking about induced earthquakes. So moving forward, our earthquake rates are still pretty high. We've been very fortunate, no particularly large earthquakes. The largest earthquake has been a magnitude 5.8. And none of these have been in major population centers. We haven't seen an earthquake near, in Oklahoma City. We haven't seen an earthquake in Tulsa. We haven't seen an earthquake in Wichita, despite the fact there is seismicity near all of these places. Earthquakes in these areas are also potentially more damaging than they are, say, here in Oregon or in California, because construction codes are not the same. And just, just to finish sort of with a, a positive note, I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, scientists, uh, academics, regulators, and industry have all worked together on this. And, and I should say I, I'm pretty impressed with, with how well we've worked together. I think it was slow going at first, but we've been working on this problem for a number of years. And industry was pretty reticent to work with us. But over the years, I think they're, they're more and more willing to work with us because they understand th this is a problem that we all want to solve. But as a scientist, I'll always tell you more research is needed. I need more seismometers, et cetera. And I will leave you with uh, a couple of things. If you want more information, uh, there's this uh, plain English uh, summary of induced seismicity that I should have covered nearly all the contents of which, but if you need a souvenir, please take one home. The more you take home with you, the less I carry back with me. <laughs> and also we have a website on induced seismicity and you can check that out and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. So anybody have a question? And one thing that I will say, I would like to uh, thank one other group. I'd like to thank the U.S. government for initially taking Dr. Rubenstein's uh, trip out here away and then graciously bringing it back. And also, in a minute, if anybody has a question, let me know. But out in the lobby, the Stelneck Museum is out there, rock, local rock museum. And our physics instructor would be happy to tell you a little bit about the upcoming lunar eclipse as well. They'll both be out in the middle of the lobby. And next time we've got both tribes as well as South Slough and uh, Coos Watershed in the lobby before and after as well. Okay, I have a good one. I moved up from Geyserville 11 years ago. I did not see Geyserville on your thing, knowing that what happened was when the Santa Rosa, the city of Santa Rosa decided to run a 36 inch pipeline up to the geysers the thermal things, and then we did start noticing that we started getting 1.2 and, and so on, you know, in, increase in earthquakes there. But those were thermal ones, as like you pointed out, here in Oregon. Um, so that was kind of interesting. I was kind of like, oh, he's going to say something about Geyserville, yay. Um, but the other thing was the geological factors. Um, as far as the injection, proximity to a fault line, was that greater uh, induced or ones that were farther away from fault lines, known fault lines that you've, that you've seen? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't bring up the geysers because, well, I guess, I guess to seismologists it's a little bit old news. We've been seeing those earthquakes for 30 years. And, and we also, they just haven't been anything particularly large there either. And, and the earthquakes in Oklahoma are such a, such a, a shock. Uh, as far as, as proximity to faults, you're asking about uh, are you more likely to have earthquakes close to faults? Um, so I showed you that map, this, that beautiful map of all the faults in Oklahoma earlier, and it looks like there's faults just about everywhere. Uh, nearly all the seismicity that we've seen in the past nine years has not been on those faults. So, um, and, and, and we're just, we're never going to know where all the faults are. And I, 
the example that I like to bring up when I talk about that is the 1994 Northridge earthquake. This is an earthquake in the valley outside of Los Angeles, a magnitude 6.7 in 1994. This occurred in one of the largest urban centers in the world, one of the largest seismically active urban centers in the world that has intensive seismological studies. And we had no idea that fault was there. So if, if we don't know where big faults are in, in LA, um, I, I think it's going to be an awful tough challenge to know where all the faults are in, in other places that just don't have the same level of scrutiny. Uh, obviously, being close to faults is, is probably important, but I, I think you're going to be close to faults just about everywhere. It's a matter of are the, is, what, is, what are the stress conditions in that individual location like, and perhaps are the faults oriented uh, appropriately given, given that stress. But it's, it's obviously something that, that we want to tease out and we want to understand, but it, it's, you know, all things are local. Could you uh, tell me how do the earthquakes and seismic activities here uh, in our nation compare to other oil producing countries like in the Middle East in Venezuela and so on. So the questions about uh, how does the induced seismicity in the United States compare to induced seismicity elsewhere. Um, the U.S. is kind of king when it comes to injection induced seismicity um, and, and we really are, are experiencing far more induced earthquakes especially related to wastewater disposal than anywhere else. Um, Canada actually does have larger earthquakes associated with hydraulic fracturing. That was where that 4.9 that I mentioned uh, is, is, is located. But when it comes to wastewater disposal, uh, Oklahoma in particular, but the United States in general really does, does appear to have, um, ha have a stranglehold on, on the lead on that. I, I am working actually with colleagues in, in Colombia and they have wells that are even larger than the ones we have in Oklahoma, about 10 times larger than the largest ones. And we are seeing earthquakes there, but nothing to the same size. The biggest earthquake that we've seen is, is low magnitude four. And uh, you know, we're looking at earthquakes of, of high magnitude fives. So, so I think th there's probably a couple things going on. I think the overall scale of injection in the United States is significantly larger than anywhere else. I don't think anybody is really doing the same, same scale of injection. I think there's also that the geology is very different in, in Oklahoma. We're injecting into the group known as the Arbuckle group. This sits right on top of the crystalline basement, and the crystalline basement is where you're having earthquakes. And so just by proximity alone, you're much more likely to be transferring your fluid pressures. And so I think those, those two are probably combining to, to produce the, the massive uh, increase in seismicity that we see in Oklahoma that we don't necessarily see other places. But I, I think a big part of it is, is we're, we're doing much more injection than other places. If a reservoir can cause an earthquake, filling or draining a reservoir can cause an earthquake, could a tsunami from a remotely generated uh, earthquake like Japan induce an earthquake when it washes up on the shore of North America? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I guess. I, I guess theoretically yes, but I think I think it's pretty improbable. It would really depend on um, on how much water you're really adding. And I think, well, in general, most most tsunamis you're looking at run-ups of of a few meters. It's only the very largest when you're right next to an earthquake that you're getting run-ups of 10 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters, and that's the sort of level you know the amount of stresses that you're really going to start thinking about causing earthquakes. Uh, you know, run up from a Japanese tsunami here is not going to be that sort of scale. So I think from distant earthquakes, it's, it's pretty improbable. Uh, from nearby earthquakes, I, in, in theory, I think it's possible, but I'm going to go with unlikely. So I kind of got myself stuck here in the middle, and I know that Dr. Rubenstein would be more than happy to answer some additional questions. If you didn't sign in the sign-in sheets, if you wouldn't mind taking a minute on your way out to do that, I would have also like to thank Justin for making time in his schedule to come up here and all of you for making your time in your schedules to come out tonight. Uh, I think this talk, even though a lot of it is distant, is still an important date because in one hour is the exact anniversary of the last great earthquake in Cascadia, January 26, 1700. 
and I've been trying to bring in, and for the last 13 years, a talk on earthquakes or tsunamis on or near this date. And I think it's an important reminder with those things that have happened around the planet that we're just fortunate that we aren't part of those statistics yet. And so I'm hoping for about 50 years down the road for myself. <laughs> um, and I know, you know, the odds are, yeah, but it's one of those things that I think that, as was mentioned, and many of you know, that preparedness piece. And for the most part, that's probably speaking to the choir a little bit. But trying to do something on this anniversary or near it has been very important just to continue to bring that forward as a remembrance of what will potentially, well, not potentially, but what will happen in the future. Hopefully not in the near, near future, but at some point it certainly will. Thank you, Justin, for making time. Thank you all. Uh, again, if you've got a place to post the March poster, feel free to pick those up. Take some of those little pieces, hand them out for the last three lectures. Enjoy your weekend and toast the anniversary of the last great Cascadian an hour.